Okay, in this video, I'm going to show you the importance of diagramming your code. Uh, in order to show you how to diagram your code, we have to start with a somewhat complex uh, implementation that allows you to see the importance of diagramming your code. So the one that I chose to show you is a MyMatrix uh, abstraction, and it uh, is an abstraction that represents a 2D array or a 2D grid or a matrix. It also happens to be project two from last semester. So this was the project that students did um, for their second project and uh, it was around like one and a half to two weeks into the semester. <laughs> so um, it's really not a uh, straightforward um, implementation and I'm going to explain it to you. Um, and it really exposes the importance of diagramming so that's why we're using it. So the basic idea is this is the behavior of my matrix. Um, when you run this code it basically fills a grid and then prints it out and so I'll go through how it does that. Um, the constructor is first called. Um, the default constructor on this class is going to build a 4x4 four four, so that's the um, like minimum size of the my matrix. Uh, the parentheses operator is uh, is overwritten for this class which allows you to fill and access the row and column uh, of the matrix that you're interested in. And so as you can see um, here, I'm just filling the diagonal elements, um, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. Okay, uh, another member function that's kind of easy to see from just uh, a larger view is that we have a getter that gets you the number of rows of the matrix. Uh, we also have a getter for the number of columns. Um, this is actually a matrix that's allowed to be staggered, or no, sorry, that's not the right word, jagged. Um, so not all the rows need to have the same number of columns. So you can see that there's actually a parameter to get the number of columns because each row can have a different number of columns. So those are some of the member functions that's the basic behavior of the functions from the user side. So um, very has a lot of similarities to R vector in some ways. Um, you know, in R vector we overwrote the square bracket operator so that it would look like an array. Um, here we're using the parentheses so that it feels <laughs> I don't know so it feels more like a matrix. I don't know. I'm just making that up actually. So this is what it looks like. Let's go to the implementation side. So this is the part that's pretty tricky. So this is a very complex implementation. For one, you can see it was templated. So that was a templated class. Um, and then the data structure under the hood of this is a doozy. <laughs> so there is a couple of member functions we need to pay attention to. The first one is the easiest is the number of rows. It's just an integer, so it's just stored as a value of how many rows. And remember, there can only be you know some number of rows. Uh, there's not; it can't be jagged on that end of the matrix. Uh, so all columns have the same number of rows. Is what I'm trying to say. Okay. The next thing you'll see is a pointer to a row struct. That's what the rows variable is. The rows member variable. The row struct is defined above it, but visually it looks like this. You have a pointer in rows that points to a C array of row structs. So this is the C array of row structs. All right, so this is what a row struct looks like. A row struct has two member variables. One is easy. It's the number of columns in that particular row. And then the second is a pointer to a C array. That pointer is templated because the matrix can hold any type and it's called calls. And somewhere in a constructor, both rows and calls are going to be allocated, but they're both just set up as pointers to the front of each of those C arrays. So calls is pointing to each of these. Okay, so that's the rough overview of the MyMatrix class implementation. 
So the implementation is about managing all of this memory that we just talked about in order to allow for things like the parentheses operator to work, um, allow for multiplication <laughs> between two matrices, um, and uh, various other matrix operations to work on this abstraction. Now, the reason I showed this is because visually this is a very linked structure and the only way to understand it is to diagram it. So now that you have an idea of how the implementation works, let's go and actually diagram some code. So let's assume that we have a matrix set up that has a 4x4 four four structure and these values stored in it. So it's a matrix that's storing integers. And this is some code that we're going to run. So we're going to kind of blindly read the code and diagram it to see what it does. When students have bugs, um, the only way to determine what is going on with their code is to diagram it. And so when you come in and ask for help on why your code isn't working, we're going to ask you to show us your diagram and show us what you have diagrammed out that it's doing. Uh, and this is what that will look like, that process. So the first thing that happens is that there is a pointer to an integer um, getting set up here, and it's called x. And it's pointing to uh, the rows array, the first position, and its calls array. So this is the first position of the rows array, and then it goes and finds its member variable and goes to where it points. So ultimately, x is going to point to the front of the calls array in the first position of the rows array. Then you uh, can see that there is another um, integer pointer uh, defined. This time it's called y, and this one is allocating new memory. This is creating a C array with six spots for six integers. And um, then y will point to that newly allocated memory. When we read this next part of the code, this code is going to loop from 0 to the size of the second element in the rows array. So that means it's going to run from 0 to 4, and then 0 to 3 because it's less than. And each time it's going to take what was ever placed in uh, what points what x points to um, and put it into y. So what that's going to look like is 5 is going to get um, copied into the first spot, 6 into the second, 7 into the third, and 8 into the fourth. Now what's going to be here? Well, we have no idea. Whatever memory was left over in that spot is currently there. Sometimes it's zero and sometimes it's complete garbage. And so uh, we don't place anything in there. So if we try to access it later, we're going to be in trouble. OK, now what's happening in this next line of code? Well, this next line of code says go to the fourth index of rows and assign its call uh, pointer to y. So we're going to just do that because that's what it says to do and this is what C++ will do. So it's saying, okay, you want to go here? Well, you didn't say you were going to use that memory, but I trust you, so I'm going to go ahead and let you do that. And so it's going to create a pointer there and point that pointer to the y array. That's what it says to do, right? And it just blindly does that copy. So again, that is doing that because rows of 4, I feel like it's always useful to write the 0 index, rows of 4 is right here. That's what rows of 4 is, right? So um, based off this implementation, there's no guarantee that we allocated, whoops, we allocated rows to be 4. It looks like we only allocated it to be, f to, um, sorry, it, there's no guarantee that we have this place in memory for the fifth um, row struct because it says here that we uh, only have set out space for four spots, not five. But when we run this code and diagram it, this is what it's going to do. So then this last step here is set number of columns to six, so it'll do that. 
And so um, now we'll have this like new array. Um, and then here, as a last step, it's going to increment this to 5. So it seems fine. And in fact, if you run this type of code on your structure, it will run fine. It will run, um, it may run fine on lots of operating systems. So it will go ahead and place memory there, no problem. Now what happens after this is what you don't know. That memory isn't yours to use, so if it ever needs to be used by any other part of your program, it could be, and the computer could allocate it to you, and it could overwrite that what we just did. Um, but the whole point is that you wouldn't even know that you were doing that if you didn't diagram it out. Um, the only way to really know that it's doing this is actually to call Valgrind on it. So Valgrind is able to catch memory errors like this. You're accessing memory that you weren't given permission to use, and so Valgrind would report an error when you run this code um, because you went into memory that you did not. So right here, this part right here is the problem. Oh, I wanted to use a different color. The memory that we allocated for um, The memory that we allocated here, totally fine. We allocated that, that's ours to use. But we didn't allocate memory for that pointer or for that num calls that we um, put at the as the fifth spot in rows. And so this is where it becomes really important. It becomes important that you run Valgrind and it becomes important that you diagram your code. Um, it's really hard to spot memory errors. Um, Valgrind helps, but it doesn't tell you exactly where they are always. Um, so uh, when your program is running, um, it doesn't mean that your code is necessarily all right. Your code can be completely wrong and it will run without compiler errors and it can run without any runtime errors. It's really hard to see the error. A lot of times what you see when you have a memory error is random behavior. So if you ever spot random behavior in your code, it's probably a memory problem. And using tools like debugging your code with print statements and um, calling Valgrind on your co code and making sure that you have clean Valgrind reports is the way to fix this. And so this is what's so tough about writing uh, these implementations of these classes. This is the toughest part, is the memory. And it's particularly difficult when your memory starts getting more complicated. So project four is going to be a linked memory structure like this. Um, you know, the first one that we did was simpler because it was one C array and it wasn't even dynamically shifting. So our next one is going to start linking memory together. And it is not possible for you to write the code without drawing out what the code is doing or what the code you what you intend the code to do. But it also helps um, when you have a problem. So you should diagram it when you write it, and you should diagram it when you trace it. So a lot of things that we start seeing when students are writing classes that where they're managing their memory is um, what is my code doing? We get that question all the time, like it doesn't make sense. Um, the only way to know is to diagram it. I can't even, I mean, I'm not trying to say that I'm amazing, I'm just saying uh, even someone who has like a lot of experience writing uh, classes or implementing uh, classes with complex memory, they cannot just read your code and understand it. They need to diagram it as well. So when when you need help debugging your code, uh, that's all we're going to have be able to do anyway. And it's a pretty slow process, so you want to do it for yourself. We won't have time to start diagramming everyone's code. Um, if your code doesn't work, um, remember that we really need to know what what your code is doing. Um, you need to know what your code is doing. You need to do cout statements. You need to have run valgrind um, so that you can determine what isn't working about your code. If you're getting random in, uh, random output, it's almost always a memory error and you will get random output. <laughs> um, and then the other common uh, sign of a memory error is when it runs differently on different machines, which doesn't really happen this semester, but um, or runs different on the auto grader versus the, uh, um, you know, the ID that you're using. Um, that's another good indication that you have a memory error. And we saw this already in the first couple of projects from people not initializing their variables. So not initializing your variables and using uninitial 
initialized vari variables is also a memory error, right? Because you don't know what behavior the code has on an uninitialized variable. So that's a little bit about diagramming. Hopefully it inspires you and gives you a little bit of some direction on how to do it for your own classes. Um, and uh, it's also fun. So, all right, that's it for this one.